Welcome to Erwin Blumenfeld from Berlin to New York, a life in photography. Erwin Blumenfeld was one of the most innovative photographers of the 20th century, who became one of the world's most highly paid fashion photographers. In this talk, Paris-based granddaughter Nadia blumenfeld Shabi gives her personal insights into the life and work of her grandfather. After the talk, there will be time for Q&A, so please post your questions in the chat or the Q&A section. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Ascher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized and Banned Art based in New York. We research, discuss, publish and exhibit artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. With this work, we commemorate their lives and achievements. I'm now honored to introduce Nadia blumenfeld Shabi, who is a granddaughter of Erwin Blumenfeld. She was born on October 5, 1960 in New York to physicist Henry and photographer Kathleen Blumenfeld, both of European origin. She grew up in Princeton, New Jersey, Geneva and Gif sur Yvette. Nadia studied medicine in Paris and became an MD and PhD in biochemistry. She worked in research and outpatient care in hemoglobin disorders and taught at a Paris University in biochemistry and bioethics. For the past 20 years, she has decreased her medical practice and increasingly involved herself in the conservation and archiving of her grandfather's photographic leg legacy. She promoted publications and curated or co-curated ex exhibits at the Tokyo Me Metropolitan Museum for Photography, the Jeux de Pomme in Paris, the Nice Nice Niep Niepce Museum in chalon sur saône Somerset House in London, Foam in Amsterdam, the Folkwang Museum in Essen, Shanghai, Sao Paulo, and very recently at the Paris Museum of Jewish Art and History, titled The Tribulations of Erwin Blumenfeld 1930 to 1950, uh, which closed in March. Nadia is the vice president of ASIM, an organization that helps young artists working in France to show their work. She lives in Paris, France with husband Jean-Louis Chabi and their three children, Milena, Gabriel, and Joachim. Welcome, Nadia. Thank you, Rachel. So it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, to speak to you about the life in photography of my grandfather, Erwin Blumenfeld. Um, I'm starting off with this double self-portrait. It is the same man on either side of the camera, but some uh, visitors recently, we had this exhibition at the Jewish Museum in Paris, couldn't believe that it was the same man on either side. So this is a superimposition of half of his face uh, uh, next to his um, Linhof camera. But before he achieved such accomplishments, uh, I will go back a little bit in time uh, to describe um, his life, which is a real uh, journey, a journey from Berlin to New York, a journey in resilience, a journey in survival, a journey in successful adaptation through many hardships and uh, also joys, of course, and successes. But you will see that uh, we call the latest exhibition the Tribulations, and it will if some of you have not seen it, it will take place at the Jewish Museum of Brussels uh, in the fall and uh, next winter. So um, he's, it starts in Berlin. Um, it goes then to Amsterdam. His, he goes to Paris and ultimately to New York uh, between 1941 and uh, 1969 uh, when he dies. So he was born in Berlin at the turn of the 20th century in 1897. But I want to show you this photograph because it reminds me of him. Uh, I knew him as a little girl. And one of the things that struck me, aside from his very strong German accent that he kept all his life, were his nails. 
because he basically had no nails. And you can see them on this photograph where he is posing face-to-face uh, -face with a mannequin. Um, he, it was because of two factors that he had no nails. One was that he was a very avid nail biter. And the second was that at the time, as maybe young people are finding out again these days, but did not grow up with, it was photography was basically chemistry. And he had his hands all day long in uh, developers and uh, uh, toxic uh, chemicals. So um, he grows up in a, in a Jewish household in Berlin. Uh, and all his life, he will say that he was never anything but a Berliner. Uh, he kept his German language. And when he wrote his autobiography, during the last 10 years of his life, but even before that, he was a very big letter writer and uh, writer. Um, he always wrote in German. Um, the German uh, Jews, um, well, he was part of the bourgeoisie of Berlin. And uh, uh, here you have a, a quite a nice picture of the family. So with his mother, Emma, Emma Kohn and uh, his father, Albert uh, uh, Blumenfeld, who uh, was um, uh, in an umbrella manufacturing firm, uh, Jordan and Blumenfeld. And here he is with his uh, elder sister, Annie. His younger brother, Heinz, uh, is born uh, around 1900, I think in 1899. So he's, he's not yet on that photograph. Uh, the bourgeois, uh, Berlin Jews were, were quite um, uh, disparaging of the Eastern European Jews who spoke Yiddish. They spoke uh, Hochdeutsch and uh, also Berliner Deutsch. And uh, they were quite uh, proud citizens of the German state. Um, here are the three children. So Erwin on uh, the right-hand side, Annie in the center and Heinz. Uh, Owen's younger brother. Um, at the age of 10, he receives his first camera and starts uh, photographing. So uh, the story how he receives his camera was quite amusing. He pretends to have a stomach ache before a Latin version. And uh, so he's immediately uh, diagnosed as having appendicitis operated on and for his bravery, his uncle Cal, who's an amateur photographer, gives him a camera. And he is one of <clears throat> his first self-portraits <laughs> at the age of um, 11. Uh, he did this in a mirror. And um, I think that the quote that all these quotes I will have on, on screen are from his autobiography that was translated into English under the title uh, Eye to Eye. Uh, he says, my real life started with the discovery of chemical magic, the play of light and shade, the two-edged problem of negative and positive. I had a good photographer's eye right from the start. And essentially, this is what he does. Chemical magic, light and shade, negative and positive. So he's a, he will become one of the great photographic experimentators. And I will show you some examples of his work. But at age uh, 13, he will do his bar mitzvah. And shortly afterwards will be the first crisis in uh, Erwin's life. His father uh, has uh, syphilis and will die uh, from this, uh, this disease of of that time that now can be treated with an injection of antibiotics, but at the time um, nothing could be done and the firm Jordan and Blumenfeld goes bankrupt and uh, Erwin has to enter an apprenticeship in uh, uh, clothes, uh, women's wear um, clothes uh, uh, enterprise of Moses and Schlochauer in Berlin and he stops his studies. Whereas his best childhood friend, Paul Citroen, uh, continues his studies and goes on to the Bauhaus and becomes an artist. So um, although he does, uh, at a young age, see 
the literary and artistic circles of Berlin, uh, um, like um, the poetess Elsa Lasker Schüler, Walter Mehring, and uh, Paul Citroen, etc., and Georges Gross. He uh, does not do any studies. He will be a self taught, very avid uh, reader, uh, uh, music lover, theater goer. But um, uh, so the, he, he does not have formal uh, education. And uh, Paul Citroen at one point tells him, uh, I have three lovely cousins in, in Amsterdam, you should write to them. And he writes to all three and one of them answers and it's Lena Citroen who will become his, his fiancé by, by letters. And uh, they will uh, meet and uh, get engaged. But the second great hardship will be uh, the First World War where he is a German soldier on the French front. Um, and uh, he is almost tried for desertion during the war, but um, uh, the great uh, sadness uh, is the death of his brother Heinz at age 18 on the French front. So right after the end of the war, he goes to Amsterdam, and uh, he marries uh, Lena Citroen in 1921. So he, um, he will stay in Holland from 1918 to 1935. This is quite an amusing uh, photograph where he has been arrested on the beach in Sandfort in Holland for having lowered a strap of his bathing suit. Because at the time men had to wear these uh, full body bathing suits and you couldn't uh, take off even one strap. So due to this uh, arrest, he could never become a Dutch citizen. He participates with Paul Citroen in the Dutch Dada movement, let's say in the Dada movement, he proclaims himself president of this movement. Uh, and this is a postcard that he will send to Tristan Tzara, um, in um, 1919-1920 to be part of the what was called the Dada Globe. So with Paul, he, he does a lot of uh, collage and uh, uh, photographic work. Um, and uh, you have an example here on uh, the left hand uh, side of the screen. Uh, and one of his pet uh, figures and heroes is Charles Chaplin. So um, I think that rather than feeling really Jewish, he felt all his life like someone who is uh, subject to the circumstances surrounding him and uh, like the immigrant that is played by Charles Chaplin. And in the center, you have a view of his living room in Zanfort uh, with many of his paintings at the time, um, other than the collage, he did a lot of, of uh, oil painting. And on the right hand side, you see also a card that comes from um, Fox Leather Company. And that is what he did as a job in Amsterdam uh, to support his now wife and soon to come children. Um, it was a leather goods shop that sold uh, handbags for women. And he called it the Fox Leather Company. So he goes from trying to be a painter, and here he is painting Lena, his wife, uh, to um, a shopkeeper uh, for leather bags. And here his children, uh, well, in the middle, a uh, little bit blurry is my father, Heinz. And on the far uh, right is Lisette, his daughter, and I believe a cousin of theirs in the center. So he has soon three children, Lisette, uh, the eldest, born in 1922, Heinz, my father, who was born in 1925, and we just had his birthday a few days ago, and Frank Jarek, who was born in 1932, uh, the youngest. And 
in the back of his second leather goods shop, he finds a dark room uh, and he starts really to, he had, as we saw from age 10, started to, to take photographs and to develop them in his uh, parents' bathroom, but now he has found a real dark room and he installs it and starts to photograph the women who come into his store. So at first I think portraits and then nudes. And he tries all the techniques that he sees in the magazines that are coming from Paris and that are developed at that time by, uh, most notably by Man Ray. Um, this is a solarized print, uh, solarizations. Uh, um, that's a technique that was uh, rediscovered by Man Ray. It was discovered by Talbot and then uh, Man Ray. I, well, the story, as the story goes, it's actually Lee Miller who turned on the light inadvertently during de the developing of uh, a print. And um, Blumenfeld tries, uh, tries th these techniques and he does more and more photography. And his first exhibits take place at the Kunstsaal van Leer in Amsterdam. Uh, Karl van Leer becomes a friend of his. He is an art dealer and uh, has a prominent art gallery. And he does his first photo uh, um, shows with um, Blumenfeld photographs. And they open to very um, mitigated, uh, let's say, uh, not too favorable reviews. Uh, on the right hand side, another solarization, a, a portrait of Eric Amann uh, around 1932. So he has his first two exhibits in 1932 and 1933. But uh, as you all know, in 1933 in Germany, Hitler comes to power and um, it becomes impossible for him as a Jew to go back to Berlin. And he had continued to go back frequently and to obtain also his leather goods from Germany. And this stops and uh, gradually his uh, shop will go bankrupt. Um, with the bankruptcy of his shop in 1935, he tries to open a, an atelier on, on uh, the Kaisersrat in Amsterdam. Uh, this is his first Hollywood starlet, Tara Twain. But... Um, he can't earn a living with photography in Amsterdam at that time. And he decides uh, to make a very bold move and go by himself uh, to Paris. But uh, before that, uh, he did uh, also some work outdoors. And this is a very interesting reportage that will be shown in Arles uh, this summer at the Rencontre Photographique uh, d'Arles uh, on the gypsies of the Sainte Marie de la Mer. So this takes place around 1930 and is very uh, unusual in his photographic career because he is mainly a studio photographer. And this is a very interesting photograph of a gypsy that uh, he recovered the negative of this photograph after the war. So I'm jumping a bit forward, but I will go back, don't worry, to uh, Paris. Um, and this photograph of the Sainte Marie de la Mer, he called it Notre Dame de la Détérioration. A gypsy mother photographed of Sainte Marie de la Mer. The only trick is done by nature. The negative deteriorated during the war in a cellar of Montparnasse. And luckily, he was able to save almost all of his photographs during the war by uh, um, uh, giving them, well, um, uh, he, he saw a model on the street in Paris just at the beginning of the war. And he said, could you keep all my glass plates and negatives for me? I have to leave Paris. And she kept them until 1946 or 47, at which time he recovered them in New York. And this negative was totally destroyed and he printed it as it was. And it's also a symbol of the fate of the gypsies during this uh, Second World War. But now let's go back to his arrival in Paris, where he will stay between 1936 and 1939. And here he is a little bit after his arrival. This is 1937 on all fours on his, uh, in his uh, studio, um, uh, Nine Rue de Lombre uh, in Paris. 
uh, with all of his photographs and very large blow ups of solarizations of women's faces, of statuary, and of tapestries. He does a lot of experimental photography in Paris in uh, those years um, for himself and also for artistic uh, publications. This is one of his very well-known series, uh, Nude Under Wet Silk, uh, and also here of a model, um, uh, Swedish countess, Margarete von Sivas. And here are the photographs from that Paris period that were in one of his books, the only book he composed actually of his photographs and that was published uh, posthumously under the title, My 100 Best Photos. But in these Paris days, he did a lot at first of portraits. And on the left, you have Geneviève Rouault, who is the daughter of the painter who is on the right, uh, Georges Rouault. And Geneviève was one of the persons who was instrumental in his coming to Paris because he photographed her in Amsterdam and she is the one who really told him, you, you can't stay here with your talent, you have to come to Paris and I will introduce you and you will do portraits of my father and his friends and the artist world of Paris and you will have a lot of success. So uh, it's a bit thanks to her that uh, he came in 1936 without a penny and at first he did not bring his family. He stayed in a hotel in Montparnasse and he started to do portraits. And he did the portraits, he has a sampling of uh, Leonor Fini, uh, Mauriac, Carmen Visconti. She was a model who posed for Rodin when she was young and he photographed her uh, as an aging model. This is Django Reinhardt and Stéphane Grappelli. Uh, the musicians, and on the bottom you may recognize uh, Henri Matisse. But none of these clients actually paid paid anything. They were they thought it was an honor for him to be photographing them. Um, <clears throat> he also did a lot of photography at the Ethnographic Museum of the Trocadero that became the Musée de l'Homme. This is his visitor's card in Paris in 1936, and he was very fascinated by African uh, and um, uh, Aztec art, although this crystal skull in the center uh, was later proven to be uh, actually a 19th century uh, German made uh, artifact. So he photographs at the Musée de l'Homme and works a little bit for them, but also this brings no money. And he participates in the first numbers of their which is a very uh, uh, highbrow uh, magazine in Paris published by Terriade. And also uh, this, these are sculptures of Mayol that he photographs for the first numbers of Verve, but these also bring uh, no money, <coughs> but they bring prestige. And all that time he had very great premonitions of the upcoming war. Since 1933 and the arrival of Hitler uh, to power in Germany, he had been working around the motif of the dictator with these uh, terrible photographs uh, on the right-hand side uh, of uh, Hitler's uh, superimposed face on uh, the skull. And uh, that was uh, called uh, Grauenfresse, so the face of horror. Um, he always predicted war. Of course, when war came, he was not at all prepared for war. He also did a series, you have to think that in 36, there's the Spanish war also. And um, he did figures with um, calf's head that he put on a, the bust of Venus and draped quite dramatically on the left-hand side. And here he is holding this calf's head. And also uh, looking quite worriedly into a mirror on the right hand side. But during that time, success is coming. 
so um he has a lot of uh, difficulty in making a living, but in 1936, he does his first advertising photograph for L'Oréal, for Mont Savon, so. And he sees that Man Ray and other photographers are earning their living in fashion photography. Up till now, he did not really uh, do fashion photography, but uh, in 1938, he is introduced by uh, Cecil Beaton, uh, whom we have here in a large uh, series because Cecil Beaton also loved to pose, I think. And Cecil Beaton, who is a very well-known uh, British fashion photographer, admires his work and proposes to introduce him to Michel de Brunoff. And so he uh, becomes uh, a Vogue photographer in 1938 and 39 in Paris and uh, does a very famous series on the Eiffel Tower in 1939. And in the summer of 1939, he goes for the first time to New York and uh, he signs a contract with Harper's Bazaar to follow the fashions uh, for them um, in Paris. And he returns to Paris um, end of August, 1939. So he is there in September 39, and um, when the, I read it to you, but you can read it also. When the old world collapsed, I was there playing my own personal part in it all. It was ugly, stupid, and life-threatening. It was only a matter of luck that I and my family managed to escape with nothing more than the fright of our lives. So in the September 1939, he is in the very awkward position of being at the same time Jewish, but also German. Well, uh, probably he no longer has his German nationality because Germany took it away from him. So they are all apatrides. But, and also his wife became German by marrying him. So they are all in the same condition of being without a nationality, but of German origin. And the French at that time, in turn, uh, in turn, um, uh, enemy, uh, aliens who are in France. So as he is from an enemy country, uh, he is bound to be interned. But he first has some reprieve during um, uh, some months between September 1939. So they leave Paris where they were all very well implanted and going to school and uh, uh, for the children uh, and they go to Vesle. And they stay there at the hotel in Vesle um, between September 1939 and May 1940. And at that point, it is no longer possible to remain in freedom. But Lena and her two young sons, so my father, uh, Henry at that time now, and uh, Yorick um, can stay free. But Lisette is interned in a, an internment camp in Burs in the Pyrenees. These camps had been opened in France for the Spanish Republicans, but then they were used to in turn, uh, for instance, the Germans at the beginning of the war. And uh, Erwin Blumenfeld is interned in the camp uh, in Burgundy at first, uh, in May 1940 as well. And his wife stays in the hotel and he writes, he writes to her, um, uh, so a postcard from the first camp, and I'd like to read it to you in French, although I do have a little, uh, uh, my image is uh, actually on top of it, but Cher amour, tout va très bien, nourriture excellente, meilleure qu'à l'hôtel. Je suis interprète et chef de magasin. J'ai bien dormi. Le matin, on se lève à 5h30, le reste est exactement comme je l'ai raconté aux enfants. Seulement voilà. J'ai 25 ans de plus. La vie est grotesque et je voudrais être Cervantes pour écrire le roman de ces jours. J'espère que vous ne prenez rien au tragique parce qu'il n'y a pas de tragique. Que la petite Lisette soit brave. Je préfère la vie dure pour nous tous au luxe calme d'Amérique. On apprend plus. Vraiment, tout va très bien. Rien ne trouble mon esprit. Baiser, perf. So I'll translate it. Uh, dear love, everything is fine. The food is excellent, better than at the hotel. I'm an interpreter and head of uh, 
uh, the stocks in the in the camp. I slept well in the morning. We get up at five and a half. The rest is exactly as I told to the children. But here it is. I'm 25 years older. Life is grotesque. And I'd like to be Cervantes to write the novel of these days. I hope that you are not taking anything tragically because there is no tragedy. <laughs> that little Lisette, be brave. I prefer the hard life for all of us to the calm luxury of America. You learn more. Really, everything is fine and nothing is troubling my spirit. Kisses, Perf. So this is kind of putting you into his frame of mind and his way of writing and his way of always having some distance with the events because life in the camp was not that easy. And from this camp, he goes to terrible camps, the Vernet d'Ariège, so he goes to L'Oriol, and then to the Vernet d'Ariège, and then uh, to Catus. And um, in Catus, uh, so the Vernet was a camp that uh, actually Arthur Kessler described quite well in The Scum of the Earth, La Lille de la Terre. Uh, in one of his books, he was interned a few months before Blumenfeld, but the situation, it was a horrible camp. And uh, of course, not extermination camps, but still uh, these internment camps were, were very, very terrible. He lost about uh, 40 pounds while he was there. And then in 1940, when France had uh, lost the war at the end of, uh, in the fall, um, the, the heads of these camps didn't really know what to do with these German uh, prisoners because uh, why would they be keeping them still? And at that time, they were not yet deporting the Jews. So he managed actually through luck and he tells his story in his autobiography, if you are interested in having really all the details of his journey there to uh, get out of these camps. And they are residents in Agen uh, in the winter 1940, 41 uh, here. Um, is Agen in the winter on uh, the left and on the right in the spring and in the center. Uh, so uh, from uh, left to right, you have Henry, Yorick and Lisette and then seated are uh, Erwin and Lena uh, and another Jewish family who is a refugee in, in Agen with them. And um, at that point, he really is ringing all the bells to desperately try to get visas and he manages through contacts and luck uh, to get at the American consulate in Marseille through the consul um, Miles Standish. He manages to obtain visas and buy uh, boat tickets and they embark and escape from France uh, in May 1941 out of Marseille on the Mount Viso cargo, uh, which he, you see a photo here. Uh, but uh, that is not the end of the story. They are supposed to be headed for Martinique, but actually they st are stopped in Casablanca. And uh, at that time, um, they cannot uh, go out of the port of Casablanca because uh, the British uh, are fearful of who are these immigrants and uh, the Germans also, uh, it's under Vichy in, in Morocco, so the confusion is quite great, but anyway, they are interned again after a while on the cargo, about one month where they sizzle on this cargo in terrible conditions, they are put in an internment camp in Morocco. The internment camp of Sidi El Ayashi, that is made for families. There are several internment camps opened by Vichy uh, for uh, these um, uh, foreign Jews who come to Morocco. And um, uh, here they are in the camp and you have Lisette on the far uh, left of the photo. My father is on, seated on the window and on the bed, Lena, who has a abscess on her breast and uh, Yorick uh, Blumenfeld's son. Uh, so they're in very bad condition, but luckily they are now um, organizations, Jewish organizations, the Joint in the United States, 
the HIAS, Hebrew Immigration Aid Society, and also um, Moroccan uh, lawyers, uh, such as Hélène Benatar, uh, who uh, really are instrumental in uh, getting them um, boat tickets and uh, their visas to enter the United States are limited in time, so they have to get out before the visas expire and they manage to uh, reach New York uh, gerettet, uh, in uh, August 1941. And here's the Statue of Liberty. Um, I resolved to smuggle culture into my new country by way of thanks for accepting me. So uh, right away, uh, Owen Blumenfeld will uh, go back to Harper's Bazaar and he is under contract. They say, where have you been for two years? And he is put back immediately to work in, in color and in the United States. And here are his uh, first, um, well, first covers and photographs. Uh, also, during the war, a lot of uh, photographs for the war effort, um, a very famous cover in the center. Well, the actual, these are the, the alternate photographs from these covers uh, in the center, the Vogue cover of um, March 15, 1945 for the Red Cross. On the, on the left-hand side is his first cover for Harper's Bazaar. So from uh, roughly 41 to 43, he shares a studio with Martin Mancacci and works for Harper's Bazaar. And in 43, he manages to have to uh, buy his own studio uh, on 222 Central Park South in New York. And um, he starts to work for Vogue. In 42 on the left, you have uh, reticulation. So he, he doesn't stop experimenting in black and white, but he does a lot of uh, color photography. And on the right-hand side is his daughter behind a fluted pane of glass. And he uses a lot of colored lights. And in the center, he is with his Deodorf camera. And he does a lot of experimental work still uh, in black and white in his studio. This is one of his uh, favorite models from 1942, Natalia Paskov. And here she is again, and some of these were published in Life in 1942. There's no Photoshop at the time. These are just colored light experiments. And here he says, um, so he has many publications, not only Harper's Bazaar and Vogue, but also Coronet, Lilliput, Pageant, Life, Look, Cosmopolitan, Photography, Kaleidoscope, Picture Post, etc. And here in the caption in one of the small magazines, he says, um, oh, I just moved the camera. Well, meanwhile, his son, his eldest son is uh, in the US Army. And so my father uh, goes back to Europe as an American soldier. Um, but luckily, he does not have the fate of the other Heinz, uh, my grandfather's brother, as you recall, who died in the First World War. Now he comes back. Luckily, I'm here. Um, so uh, Henry goes uh, not only to France, but also uh, to the Philippines then. Um, and here he is with his mother. Uh, he must be training in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, all his life, uh, my grandfather was very attracted to also the masters. Even if he now is in the United States, uh, he is always looking back over his shoulder to Europe, to the European masters and um, of course, on the uh, on the right hand side of the screen, this is a photo from 1937 of my father behind a black veil that he called uh, Titus as uh, Rembrandt's son. And um, the two others are um, reminiscent of, of Raphael, 
he also is, is, was all his life fascinated by uh, cathedrals, but he does them with superimpositions. And on the right is his first hotel room. So when he is in the United States and earning a really uh, great living with fashion photography, he must think about the time when he arrived in Paris alone uh, in this kind of Hotel de Passe, the Celtic Hotel uh, in Montparnasse, that he had to leave the room between four and seven in the afternoon for um, other uh, clients. And um, on the left, you have a superimposition of uh, this woman, uh, also negative, positive play, and she is superimposed over the negative of a wall he photographed in Vesley. So even if he is in the States and he becomes American, an American citizen in 1946, and he is forever grateful, he still has all his European references in mind when he does his photographs. And this is reminiscent of François Boucher. And this is um, kind of uh, uh, also, as I showed you, the gypsies. These are uh, ceremonial dances of Native Americans. He goes for his 50th birthday in January 1947 to uh, Pueblo near Santa Fe and photographs the ceremonial uh, dances and in Taos. So he is always interested by also, I think, um, other communities other than the Jewish community that have had hardships all through their lives. But aside from that, fashion, fashion in New York City, uh, here's a very beautiful uh, Evelyn trip in a dress by Dior, the sergeant dress. Uh, because it's reminiscent of a painting by John Singer Sargent. Maybe his most famous cover uh, and one of Vogue's most famous covers, the January 1950 issue called The Doe Eye. Uh, Jean Patchett is the model. But uh, it's from a black and white print where he took out the nose and left just the eye, the mouth, and a beauty spot. Lillian Markinson for Vogue also, and Gloria Barnes. So he does a lot of fashion photography. But at one point, uh, he always has trouble with the authority of the art directors such as Alexander Lieberman at Vogue or Alexei Brodovich at Harper's. And um, the Dayton company, that's a women's wear company in Minneapolis, actually gives him a complete freedom to, to do his own runway. And as you see on the, on the far right, Benny Yelverton, who is an African-American model, is one of the first to be on a runway. And so he can do as he chooses and they gave him complete freedom. And he actually uh, stops working for Vogue in 1955 and starts to write his um, autobiography. He does a lot of advertising still. And as he, I told you, one of his first clients was L'Oréal for Mont Savon and one of his last ones was also L'Oréal, he is for Dop. He writes his autobiography during his last 10 years, Ein Bildungsroman, that in English is called Eye to Eye. And uh, here is Valeska Gert. Uh, so he illustrates it. It's, um, it's illustrated by about 70 photographs, but it's really a work of literature. He considered it to be as important in literature as he was in photography. And um, it has been translated into many languages, eye to eye in English, jadis et daguerre in France, and it recently appeared in pocket format in France um, at Actes Sud. And um, those who read German may uh, be amused by this, but if you want to, uh, you have to find Einbildungsroman and read uh, 
read the autobiography. And here is also a, a photograph of Cecil Beaton. Uh, mit Cecils Protektion landete ich bald im Vogue-Betrieb und lehrte diesen kunstfernen Eitelkeitsjahrmarkt in den prätentiöse Annoncerpress den Arbiter elegant herum raushängen zu verachten. <lacht> Illusionen sind da, um verloren zu gehen. Okay, illusions are made to be lost. And Michel de Brunoff, the Redakteur en Chef of Paris, erklärte mir, enlightened me. Si vous seriez seulement né baron, if you were only born a baron, and est devenu pederast and became a pederast, you would be the greatest photographer of the world. Vous seriez le plus grand photographe du monde. But I had already understood le monde n'existe plus. And uh, many articles. I end with this quote by him that was in Popular Photography in uh, September 1958. I was an amateur, I am an amateur, and I intend to stay an amateur. To me, an amateur is one who is in love with taking pictures, a free soul who can photograph what he likes and likes what he photographs. By that definition, I am an amateur. So that is the definition that I accept. So to love what you photograph um, and photograph what you love, that is, that is the definition of being a photographer. Uh, here he is on West Hampton Beach, a house that was later wiped away in a hurricane. Um, and uh, I'll uh, end my talk here. There's an internet site if you want to have more news and follow up. So thank you, thank you very much. I hope that there are still a few minutes for, for questions. Uh, do I go to the last slide, Rachel? Uh, yeah, you can also close it now. Okay, I stop. Arrêtez le partage. I stop the sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nadia. You're welcome. So this was a fact-packed, uh, amazing lecture. And um, to our audience, we now have time for Q&A. So please post your questions. Um, I'm actually wondering, like you showed in his late work, especially, you showed a lot of uh, um, uh, kind of art photography um, that he, and I'm wondering whether he sold that as well, or uh, did he only um, sell in uh, with the magazines, with Harper's uh, Bazaar, Vogue, and then with the advertisement? So at the time, um, color photography uh, was just for magazines right. or advertising. It was not sold at all in galleries. Mm -hmm. uh, black and white, he showed in some group shows, uh, especially at the Museum of Modern Art on several occasions. He had group shows, never uh, solo shows. And... Um, no, the gallery world, I mean, in 1969, when he died, uh, photography was really not, not uh, uh, a commercial uh, object, uh, so to speak. It was, um, it was not yet uh, sold by galleries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so he did it uh, just for himself to balance all this, yes, uh, he did it also to show in museums or mm -hmm. exhibitions, uh, mm -hmm. but not really um, to sell as artwork. Okay, okay. So Jenny's asking whether there are upcoming exhibitions in the US. And uh, I would like to know whether there are upcoming exhibitions, period. <laughs> oh, so in the US, um, there is, uh, I don't know, he's, he fell into a, a, a hole in, in the memory of, uh, uh, he was very, a very well-known photographer. And um, there may be a problem not finding his place in, in the US. And um, 
for the moment, although I have had contact with a number of museums, um, there are no shows planned in the United States, unfortunately, but um, if anybody has any uh, uh, ideas, suggestions, or uh, would like to show uh, uh, his work, uh, it would be a pleasure. Um, I have had many contacts and for the moment, no uh, shows. There was a show actually at the Jewish Museum in New York about, mainly it was focused on art directors coming uh, out of Europe, such as Bordovich and Lieberman, who are also uh, immigrants uh, during that same time frame, and uh, who so there were quite a few Blumenfeld photographs shown in that show, and I was quite happy that was during the COVID period in 2021, I believe. Uh, on the other hand, in Europe, there have been many shows also elsewhere in, in Tokyo and in, in China and Brazil, um, and there's the. The next one will be in Brussels at the Jewish Museum of Brussels from mm -hmm. September 28 till February 4, 2024. So it will start in the fall. Wonderful. And of course, there are uh, quite some, some books published about his work. So I will... There are many books. There's, there was recently a photo file at Thames and Hudson. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if anybody can see this, but... Um, this is uh, very easy to uh, to buy, and it's a really a, a, a small book, but it's a good summary of of his work. Mm -hmm. And it's all on the website, and I will send, it's all on the website. send out the link. Um, so Monica is asking uh, multiple questions. Um, she's curious to know if Irvin's path crossed with Varin Fry in wartime Massey. Uh, not to my knowledge. I think that, well, Varian Fry was, um, of course, uh, it's almost, I'm always surprised, it's almost the only name that's mentioned when you have someone from the US uh, consulate helping Jews escape from Marseille. And he did, uh, of course, help many obtain visas, uh, many of the, uh, from the art world, the literary world. But actually, uh, to my knowledge, uh, it was another council in Marseille uh, by the name of Miles Standish, like the Miles Standish of the Mayflower, um, uh, who helped Blumenfeld. And he describes uh, their encounter actually at the Marseille consulate in his autobiography, and it's quite amusing. But I do not know if he crossed the path of Varian Fry. I, I do not think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then she asked uh, uh, whether you know, uh, whether you can expand a little bit about Irvin's uh, relationship to, with Valeska Gerd. Ah, yes, sure. Um, well, he tells a tale in his book, but most of the tales in his autobiography were proven to be completely accurate that he encounters her first in Berlin uh, when he was very young and it's uh, actually, Valeska Gert, uh, she was a very extraordinary uh, performer. Um, that's perhaps the best way to, to, you can't really pin down what she did. She was one of the creators of modern dancing and also um, very strange and uh, uh, fantastic uh, performer. And so she started her first, her real name was Gertrud Zamosch and she was, when you read her autobiography, that's really a fantastic read. Ich bin eine Hexe, I think. I'm a, voilà, je suis une sorcière. I'm a witch. Uh, she tells that she's from exactly the same part of Berlin as Blumenfeld, the same milieu bourgeois. And she also escapes her, her milieu and she becomes this incredible dancer. And they later meet in Paris. Uh, and uh, in the show in Paris, there was a photograph of, of them at uh, the Café du Dôme, uh, taken by another Jewish photographer, Willy Meywald. So they meet again in Paris, and then he sees her again, and the biggest beggars, um, she opens a bar when she, uh, she also immigrates to the United States, and uh, she opens a, uh, the beggar's cellar, a bar in New York, and uh, he encounters her again there. But and he photographs her in New York. Mm. 
Wonderful. Wow. <laughs> so uh, the questions keep coming in now. Um, do you know if the model Margarete von Sievers was related to the photographer Wolfgang Sievers? That might be a little, it goes a little. Uh, I do not, but um, so I could ask my father because he remembers Margarete von Sievers. Uh -huh. so, um... <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, Mark is asking whether um, Irvin worked uh, with Magnum in New York. No. No. Yeah. I don't know what year Magnum was actually founded. Um, was founded when uh, um, when Blumenfeld was was still working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was it Definitely. posterior to that? No. It was founded by the of uh, 1947. Oh, Deborah Bell knows everything, so thank you, Deborah. 1947. Okay. No, I don't believe he worked for Magnum. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks. So Susan is asking, um, uh, is wondering about what happened to his extended family. Once he came to the States, how did he stay in touch with his family and friends in Europe, be it Amsterdam or Paris? Did he? Uh, so um, he, when they left Vesle, so actually his family or his, his family, uh, the son are in Israel, and he never went to Israel while he was alive. Uh, so from his family, the Blumenfeld side, um, his mother died before the Second World War of tuberculosis. His, also his sister, same thing. His brother died in the war and they had no children. So actually the, his family was, was kind of died also before the, the Second World War. His wife's family, on the other hand, uh, some were instrumental in helping him come to the United States. Um, in, uh, actually, they did not go through Ellis Island. You may wonder why, because my grandmother had already a sister in New York at that time in, in, uh, in Great Neck, I believe. Uh, Rose uh, Citroen and uh, uh, they had uh, her husband was bright enough to immigrate before the war but uh, other members of the Citroen family who were in Holland were uh, exterminated in Auschwitz and others survived and uh, uh, I'm in touch with uh, because my grandmother had several brothers and sisters and uh, uh, well, her, her youngest brother died a few years ago, Carl, at age 102, I believe, but his son, his sons are still in Amsterdam. So some are still in Amsterdam, some immigrated through France and went to Israel, went then to, so I'm in touch also with them. Um, I think that Lena kept in touch much more than uh, Erwin mm -hmm. with the family, because mm -hmm. it was mainly her side of the family that still existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark is asking, uh, and that's, I think we have, yeah, Mark is asking who is in possession of his work to contact regarding a show or shows in the US and internationally? So uh, when he died, uh, he, well, he died quite young, actually, from a heart attack in Rome in 1969, and his work was in the studio. And in his will, he left the disposal rights to his assistant at the time who bought also the studio from my grandmother. And she decided to distribute these works because they, they were, as, you, as I was telling you, at the time you, he was not selling these prints. So he had a lot of these prints in the studio and they were split into four, roughly, one four so this was a bit of the problem of his legacy also one fourth to uh, each of his children and one fourth was kept by uh, his assistant and uh, later on I received all the color transparencies from her and I worked on that at first about 15 to 20 years ago with a museum in France and so uh, reconstructing colors and doing uh, modern prints because they are magazine pages, but they were no prints. They are big transparencies, original transparencies. And from those, I did a show that went uh, around the world, but um, black and white, um, we uh, have original prints and some are kept by his 
one of his sons my father has and so they're a bit dispersed but when I did the show at the Jewish Museum I was able um, to have from the family loans from the family quite easily and also there are many works in museums in Holland because Paul Citroen uh, his uh, Dutch um, so cousin afterwards my grandmother's cousin and friend left um, the works that Blumenfeld had given him part of, at the Leiden Bibliothek, part of the Stedelijk in Amsterdam, the Berlinische in Berlin has a number of beautiful prints. Um, uh, so uh, they are also in, kept by uh, museums and institutions around the world. But also there, there's a bit of a dispersion. I was in touch with the Rochester Eastman uh, Foundation in Rochester recently. Uh, they have about 80 Blumenfeld prints um, that were given to them by Blumenfeld's assistant. And um, uh, I was asking if they couldn't do a show, but you know, it's, uh, voila. And in Israel, there are some beautiful prints also and uh, collage uh, at the Israel Museum. Uh, so a bit all over. So it's but it's easy. It's easy to have loans. It's easy when there was a major show at the Jeu de Paume in Paris in 2013. There were loans from um, so Ute Eskilsen was the commissaire, and there were loans uh, from 35 different uh, uh, institutions and and uh, private uh, collectors, etc. In uh, the Jewish Museum, it was. Uh, mainly from five or six different sources. The Pompidou Museum has also a beautiful selection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. So it sounds like you're the uh, person to ask for. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, through the site, through the site, the questions then go to my cousin, Remy Blumenfeld, who is also involved in, uh, in, in this. And uh, he did a beautiful documentary about his grandfather that you can see, I think, a man who shot beautiful women. And uh, so the questions go to him and, and to me through the site and we respond. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I will put that um, information also in the follow up email. Um, uh, Remy Blumenfeld's documentary is uh, available on Amazon Prime, so very easy access. Um, Nina is asking whether your grandfather had his photographs hanging in his home. Did he put them up or no? He had artworks. He had uh, many photographs in his studio. So he had... Um, his residence was at 1 West 67th Street, Hotel des Artistes. Mm -hmm. And there, I don't recall that many photographs. They were mainly paintings. And he loved early American paintings. And uh, on the other hand, when I went to his studio, there were photographs all over. And he did, um, he composed uh, uh, screens with many, he, he just uh, uh, stapled photographs. You know, at the time, and he never considered photographs to be such a precious item. He would print and he would just uh, nail them, uh, staple them to the wall. And he did, he, he made screens with uh, a lot of uh, his photographs, uh, black and white prints on them that would be maybe valuable today. But at the time he would just uh, uh, thumbtack them or whatever, and they were all over the studio on the walls in the dressing room of the models. Uh, uh, but at his home, uh, less. And did he, did he inspire one of his children to become a photographer? Um, uh, no, I think he was a very, he had a very powerful personality and maybe they tried some other things. Well, my father always tells me he took more photographs than his own father because he works in uh, physics, in experimental physics, and he took many photographs of uh, uh, particles in bubble chambers. And uh, but um, uh, so my mother was a photographer, but she was his daughter-in-law, and uh, he inspired her probably. Um, 
Lisette was very good at drawing, but uh, did not pursue a career in photography. She was his assistant also at one point. Uh, and uh, Yarek, uh, the youngest son, he uh, became a journalist and a writer. And uh, so he's more in the, in the written world, um, not that much in photography. Mm -hmm. And then the grandchildren, so um, uh, my son actually does film and photography somewhat, yes, uh, Joachim, the youngest son. Um, uh, grandchildren, uh, uh, not really either. <laughs> not really. Well, but it sounds like there's a lot of creativity uh, flowing in your family, in the whole family, really, from all sides. From all sides, absolutely. <laughs> also uh, from all the, his children, all married, creative uh, persons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you yourself actually did quite a radical career change, right? To devote your life now to uh, uh, to your grandfather's work or to promoting or teaching about your grandfather's work, right? Yes. Well, I was already teaching in uh, bioethics and uh, hematology and so on well still teaching somewhat teaching <laughs> if that's the right word but sharing sharing yes sharing yeah very different <laughs> very different field <laughs> oh, wonderful um thank you so much nadia i want to conclude with a poignant quote by avin bloomfeld which is so much more even I think even more much uh, more relevant today. He said, photography is so easy a medium to use. The box camera or all of film snap a picture. Photography, the art is so immensely difficult because it is so easy to get a picture of sorts. One must work hard to smuggle anything into a photo photograph other than record keeping. And I think he did that uh, in a, a fascinating and very innovative and creative way uh, uh, in all his in all his work he uh, so I'm glad that um, you agreed to speak and uh, talk to us and thank you so much I'm getting many many uh, notes here in the uh, in the chat thank you what a wonderful presentation his work seems groundbreaking thank you so much for uh, uh, talking about him. So uh, thank you so much, Nadia, again. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, and thank you for pleasure. everyone for being with us today and take good care and stay well. Thank you. Thank you.